from Microbe TV. This is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 155, recorded on July 19th, 2018. Vincent and Yellow, and joining me today, after an extended hiatus, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. Good how's, to see you again. How's your hiatus? Um, it's it's not herniating anymore, and I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> You've been absent from TWIP? Yeah, no, I've been bit. peripatetic. I've been peripatetic. Right. Uh, so Dixon is right here in studio. Right. Also joining us from a remote location, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Hey, and uh, And... Uh, Nice. Welcome back, Dixon. I miss you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the feeling is mutual. <laughs> <laughs> did you miss? Did you miss Dixon? You know, Dixon I, miss Dixon. <laughs> did I say that? I think you did. Actually, well, I meant Daniel. Did you miss Dixon? I miss Dixon. Some, I, some you know. of our some of our listeners missed you also. Well, I'm, that's um, um, and in fact, Daniel and I often would come across something and say, "We don't know. We'll have to get." No, no I, I listened. Don't worry. I heard, I heard the, the the podcast and. and I'm um, I'm honored to be part of this team. Let's just put it that way. Also here in studio, we have a guest. He is an attending physician in infectious diseases here at Columbia University Medical Center. Justin Aaron, welcome to TWIP. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for having me. I'm a big fan of the show. Well, I guess a uh, long-time <laughs> listener, first-time guest. But not <laughs> the, last, not not the last time. Not the last time. Columbia University Medical Center. I think that's the Colleague right name. Colleague of Daniels. Is that the right name, is it? I think they added it's, some other it's name. It's Irving. Medical Center. Columbia Center. University Irving Medical Center. Irving Medical. That's yeah. the one. Irving then there's Center. college. Then there's the Vagilos College of right. Physicians and Surgeons. Right. All right. So here we are. And we are going to tackle a case that... Um, Mm -hmm. Daniel presented last time. Yeah, so I had uh, seen a challenging case, or an interesting and, and challenging case, and had actually um, sent Daniel either a, a, given him a call or a text message or an email to kind of get his opinion on the uh, clinical management decisions, um, knowing his expertise in, in, uh, in the world of parasitology. And uh, he thought it was a great case and would be a good uh, um, potential case for the show. All right. Okay, then. So let's, can you re review it for us? Uh? So uh, uh, this case is a 79-year-old man with a history of CLL, which is chronic lymphocytic leukemia that mm -hmm. transformed to uh, a B-cell lymphoma who had been receiving uh, chemotherapy for a, a few weeks before he came in. He was discharged with a script for prednisone at a, a fairly high dose of 100 milligrams that he was supposed to take for five days uh, around his chemotherapy regimen. Um, but there was some kind of confusion with the pharmacy, and he ended up taking it every day at that dose for two weeks, which was um, not noted till he went to his hematologist. Uh, he was actually having fevers to about 100 degrees at home, uh, started to complain of headaches, and uh, developed a dry cough. Uh, was brought into the ER by his family, uh, where they reported that he'd lost weight. They weren't really sure how much, but uh, wasn't really having any other specific symptoms at that point in time. Uh, his initial workup in the hospital showed that he had a fever. He had a chest x-ray concerning for a pneumonia and was started on antibiotics, but his fever and symptoms continued. Uh, his steroids were, were stopped at this point in time. He had a CAT scan of his chest that uh, showed uh, a multifocal uh, ground glass opacities um, and nodules, which was concerning for uh, some kind of multifocal pneumonia or possibly an atypical infection, uh, at which point in time we as the infectious disease consult team uh, were were contacted. Um, he also had a history of latent tuberculosis that had previously been treated, um, hypertension, coronary artery disease. Um, he'd been on uh, some prophylactic medications while getting the chemotherapy, uh, Bactrim, uh, an antifungal, uh, and an antiviral, um, was born in the Dominican Republic, but had been living in the United States uh, since the 1970s, but does visit occasionally the last time being a few months before this presentation, lives with his wife here in Washington Heights um, uh, with no pets, um, no toxic habits. Uh, he, uh, on exam, Besides having the fevers, heart rate was you know normal. Blood pressure was normal. He looked fatigued and was coughing and had some uh, crackles in his lungs, um, uh, as well as an old 
murmur on exam, uh, no rashes, and seemed confused, but the family thought that was uh, near his baseline. Um, his TB testing was was negative uh, for, for active tuberculosis in the hospital. He had an antibody for strongyloides that was sent that was negative. Um, his white count continued to increase, and while he did not have a eosinophilia when he initially presented to the hospital, it actually rose to 30% over an absolute eosinophil count of 7,000. Um, and uh, so at this point, a stool ONP was ordered, but he unfortunately became constipated. Um, and then on, uh, a CAT scan had some thickening of his colon. All right. We had quite a few guesses for this one. Multiple guesses. First one is from Alexander. I've been working slowly through the YouTube playlist you made. It was originally taught that the best way to learn was to write it all down in a book. I'm really happy that it includes spelling, as while I was <laughs> learning most of my phytoplankton taxonomy, I had to guess how the names were spelled after hearing them quickly, but now I feel that I at least understand enough of it to be able to stumble my way through pronunciation and get it mostly right. I was wondering if you had any resources to go further on the laboratory diagnostic mm -hmm. methods. You, do you have any you mean, Is there a, a new book on laboratory diagnosis? I, I, anything, there is. Anything. I think there is, but you know, that, that has a, been a very rapidly changing uh, landscape because in the beginning it used to be all microscopy and now it's mostly DNA testing. So Daniel, do you know of any books that uh, actually, besides ours, that brings us up to date? <laughs> I mean, it just includes like laboratory diagnostic methods and nothing else because our our book obviously does that, but uh, it's got lots of other information in it also. You know, Dixon, um, I think what you're saying is actually um, really correct that the field is moving so quickly that it, it's really a challenge, right, for there to be a book that's um, – up to date, you know, and, and I hate to pick one because then, you know, you get the, no, maybe it's good. Then you get the response from the people emailing in, oh, why didn't you mention this other book? <laughs> um, but no, there, there is a, there is a book that's actually um, probably fifth, maybe sixth edition at this point um, out of ASM Press. That's Lynn um, Garcia's book? Exactly. Um, yeah. what, what do you think, of, what would you say about that one? So Diagnostic and Medical still, Parasitology by Lynn Shore Garcia. Yep. It's still got mostly morphology in it. I think it's less... Uh, molecular than it should be. Yeah. No, and that that's going to be the challenge. Any of these books um, are going to, you know, and, and I think for the morphology, right, the London School of Tropical Medicine is using some of our appendices. That's true. And, and so I don't know how much of a, of a book do you need to say, oh, we now do PCR or we right. now use this ELISA kit. I mean, I don't yeah. know if you, um, it would be, um, uh, I guess the issue of the lab setting up the right um, available tests. But as far as learning how to do them, learning how to do a kit is going to be the little insert piece of paper in there, learning to do the PCR or a multiplex is basically going to be learning um, how that assay works. But sure. I, I think that things have moved so quickly that the textbook is um, – going to have trouble keeping up with the advances. I would agree. And the other thing, of course, to mention is that morphology hasn't lost its place in diagnosis because the world's laboratories haven't all modernized at the same rate. So in many places, they're still using microscopy as the standard diagnostic method. Yeah. yeah. We, we had a, yeah. I think we gave away a copy of uh, Garcia's book here. On Did we? Yeah, I know I had one from ASM. Okay. Yeah. We could do a, another one if you wanted. I'm sure Lynn wouldn't re mind that at all yeah well she's not going to pay for it though she surely is <laughs> <laughs> but you've got a connection to asm maybe we can hook into that somehow okay continuing with alexander for this case study i focused on the lung and increased the eosinophils and found out about loffler of loffler's syndrome gotta love a good umlaut <laughs> this gave me a few species to look at after scanning through the book and looking at every time lung was mentioned uh, yay for control f gonna miss that if i ever get the book <laughs> I saw Ascaris lumbricoides, Strongyloides, Stercoralis, Encelostoma, Duodenale, and Nicator americanus. You said the patient was negative for Strongyloides. From page 233 of Parasitic Diseases on Hookworms, quote, the tissue migrating larval stages do induce circulating eosinophilia one to two months after exposure, end quote. In Parasitic Diseases, hookworms, in general, I guess, cause vomiting and abdominal pain, though. Test for Strongyloides came back negative. Man seems to have the same symptoms as A. lumbricordis moving into its intestinal stage. Again, as a reminder, I am not an expert in the field of parasitology and should not be considered a replacement for a <laughs> professional. <laughs> That's a nice caveat. Yes. Dixon. Yeah, two wink writes, 
Dear TWIP professors, thanks for another great case. <clears throat> At the start of this case report, I was sure he had toxoplasmosis. Then I heard that he was on Bactrim prophylaxis and developed market eosinophilia when the steroids were withdrawn. Neither situation favors toxo. Strongyloides then seemed very likely, but he was seronegative and had no diarrhea. So I took out my international health guide, and I did not look up the Dominican Republic, but I looked up Haiti, thinking that parasites found there might have been in the DR back when our patient lived there. But neither Trichuris ascaris, which are area and Solostoma, or Mancinella seemed to fit. So my guess is going back to Strangeloides stercoralis, because this serology is often misleading and the intestines may stop contracting in such an ill individual. I think I liked most about this case is that it was not my patient. <laughs> <laughs> Wink, Wayne Bird from Atlanta. <laughs> Daniel. Carol writes, greetings, Twipsters. I am going to venture a guess for the gentleman in episode 154's case study, but if I get it wrong, I can only blame my lack of a copy of Parasitic Disease. Oh, <laughs> uh, there's a PDF version. I'm sorry. That's not an excuse. <laughs> <laughs> it's free. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> I suspect the gentleman in question is suffering from schistosomiasis possibly an exacerbation of chronic schistosomiasis due to the prolonged course of prednisone he mistakenly had. Random, desperate Googling. Again, I lack a, I think, I think this is a paper copy of parasitic disease. Hard. <laughs> a hard copy. That's right. It tells me that pulmonary schistosomiasis can appear as ground glass opacifications on CT and cause a cough. <clears throat> Chronic schistosomiasis can cause confusion, and colon thickening is not unusual. S. Mansoni is endemic in the DR, so the gentleman could have been infected during his visit a few months prior to presentation. I'm no doctor, but if my guess happens to be correct, then praziquantel appears to be the treatment of choice. Dr. Google may have misled me, but hopefully not as I would love to be entered in the draw. Sincerely, Carol. Yeah, and Dr. Google just lost the $5 billion worth of lawsuit from uh, the EU. Yeah, I heard about that. Now, now this will be a true test. So perhaps if Carol gets this one right or wrong, and then she gets a copy and we see the impact on our next guest. Right, right. <laughs> Remember, you <laughs> so, get the PDF free. Remember that. Yeah, so you want to pass the, uh, the, the thing to Aaron. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, so he can read number four from Chris. Sure. So Chris writes, greetings, Twippers. It's a relatively mild and dry 87 degrees Fahrenheit day in Athens, Georgia today, but our six-legged airborne parasites are very much out for blood. <laughs> this is a challenging case with many potentially important factors at play, but the combined respiratory and intestinal signs bring to mind a few parasites. Schistosome eggs can produce the chest CT results shown while the adults living in the vasculature surrounding the large intestine may result in its damage and subsequent thickening. Schistosomiasis transmission is interrupted in the DR. However, so this seems unlikely. The pulmonary larval migration of certain GI parasites like roundworm and hookworm seems to be possible candidates. I also considered pneumocystis arising from the extended use of prednisone, but this doesn't explain the, pres the presence of colon thickening nor presence in the face of uh, anti- Biotics, I think that, or antimycotics, sorry. Uh, uh, both TB and strongyloides also seemed likely, but the testing has ruled them out. The symptoms seem to suggest a pre existing intestinal parasitic infection stimulated by immunosuppression. I'm very curious to see what the intestinal biopsy reveals, but until then, my guess will be one of the aforementioned geohelminth species acquired during a visit to the DR. Thanks for the fascinating and puzzling case, Chris. <laughs> Carlo writes, hi, TWIP trio for the case study of TWIP 154, 79-year-old man with B-cell lymphoma who received a prolonged dose of high-dose steroids. The differential includes strongyloides, ascariasis, and hookworms due to a combination of findings, pneumonitis, cough, oxygen requirements, CT chest with nodules and ground glass opacities, GI manifestations, constipation, CT with colonic thickening, and peripheral eosinophilia. Strongyloides is the most likely cause, as there can be hyperinfection and dissemination in immunocompromised individuals. In the case of our patient, he became immunosuppressed due to the high dose of steroids that he had inadvertently received. As our patient's immune system became depressed, the nematode propagated and disseminated, leading to his state of hyperinfection. Thickening of the colon is likely due to the burrowing of the L3 larva into the mucosa, thus propagating a cycle of autoinfection. He also likely acquired a secondary bacterial enterocolitis, which led to a paralytic ileus 
and his reported constipation. Transmission probably occurred during his time in the DR, as it can be found in the Caribbean. Caribbean. Although it would not necessarily have been during his last visit, as strongoloides can live for up to five years. He most likely became infected while he was not wearing shoes on dirt or grass, as the strongoloides mode of transmission is via skin penetration. Scoriasis is another potential diagnosis due to the migrate pulmonary findings and eventual signs of intestinal obstruction due to the high burden of worms in the intestinal lumen. Ascariasis larvae typically invade through the small intestine, which would not be consistent with the colonic thickening seen on CT. Additionally, there was no mention of hepatobiliary complaints, during which the worms travel up the biliary tree and feed on the liver parenchyma. Hookworm infections could also be a possibility, but there was no mention of iron deficiency, anemia, rashes, dermatitis, or abdominal pain. To diagnose this patient, one could obtain antibody stool O and P or GI biopsies. The antibodies were likely negative as per PD-6 sensitivities and specificities can vary significantly. Additionally, if the IgG antibodies were checked instead of the IgM, then the IgG antibodies may not have been produced by the host at the time they were checked. Sensitivity of stool exam is also less than 50%. However, it would be tough to obtain a sample in our patient due to constipation. Diagnosis was likely made in this case via biopsy of the duodeno or colonic mucosa. Ivermectin would be the treatment of choice for days to weeks, plus or minus albendazole. Mm. Looking forward to the next podcast is Carlo Palacios, MD at University of Maryland Medical Center. Hey, he's in his third year. This is great. PGY3? Yep. What is PGY3? Postgraduate year three. So that would be a, a third year uh, uh, resident. In, so okay. physician, right. but still in, in the training. Program. And Got knowing it. where he is, he's probably seen some of this already anyway. Yeah, so he's in internal medicine and pediatrics. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. So okay. those guys, that's usually a four-year training program. So maybe another year or two here, and he'll be uh, going into infectious disease. There you go. Gavin writes, Dear TWIP team, I get the 4th of July off, which means that I finally have time to sit down and investigate the case from TWIP 154. I found this one to be very challenging. I just wrapped up my first year of medical school, and somehow that made crafting a differential even more difficult. For example, we know our China acronym for eosinophilia, so does eosinophilia due to the H or the N. According to the update, Almost any B or T cell lymphoma or leukemia can be implicated in causing eosinophilia. In addition, some of the other nonspecific symptoms could be due to the cancer or therapy. At first, I thought that the prednisone, uh, or prednisone rather, was the key to this case, but my lab mate was looking over my shoulder at my case notes and thought that the steroids wouldn't contribute much to the existing immunosuppression from chemo, aside from masking the eosinophilia. The DLBCL is normally treated with CHOP, which is fairly aggressive and is known to have pulmonary side effects of its own. I hope people understood what that meant because I didn't. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> so it's diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, DLBCL, and CHOP, which is it's a combination of um, basically chemo agents. I see. I know um, it as Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or it's a show on television about cooking. Um, it's chopped. I'm sorry. Inter interstitial pneumonitis, dry cough, ground glass on CT, pneumocystis, Jarovicki, dry cough, ground glass on CT related to prolonged prednisone. However, we know that something was found on upper endoscopy, and this is TWIV. So there is a super long parasitic. It's not TWIV, it's TWIP. TWIP. <clears throat> it says TWIV here, though. Yeah, so yeah. this, so here is a super long parasitic differential. Ascaris, hookworm, toxicara, schistosoma, strongyloides, and the tropical eosinophilia hypersensitivity reaction to Ucheraria bancrofti and Brugia malayi. This email is already getting a little long, so I won't get into gory details of which are present in the, in the DR. Most which cause lung disease, colitis, and which have been found on endoscopy. I think that this patient has hyperinfection and dissemination of strongyloides stercorallis, and that the serology was falsely negative due to the immunosuppression. However, I would ask about another risk factor, such as walking barefoot and freshwater exposure. Thanks again for the awesome case. Looking forward to hearing how you reasoned it through this one. The best, Gavin, is at UCSF School of Medicine. Daniel. 
All right. I'm going to come back to some things in that one. I, I think there's some interesting comments there. And um, I always enjoy the emails make me rethink things. So mm. just I'll admit that to our to our listeners. Um, <laughs> I learn a lot from the email. So thank you. Here, so here. I'm going to have some very, um, <clears throat> well, I think they're interesting comments. I've had thoughts that I'm finding interesting. <laughs> I will right. share them. <laughs> about that? Kendra writes, hello, my name is Kendra. I first learned of Microbe TV podcast last summer, and I enjoy listening to TWIP. TWIV and TWIM. I recently graduated from Colorado State University with an MS in microbiology. Uh, Hello from there. I spent 10 years living in that town, Mm -hmm. Fort Collins, Colorado. Currently, I'm working as a veterinary assistant and hope to attend veterinary school in the future. I believe the diagnosis for the most recent case study presented is schistosomiasis, S. mansoni. Schistosomiasis is found in the Dominican Republic and may be contracted from contaminated water. A symptom of S. mansoni is nodular changes and ground glass opacifications in the lungs. It may also increase the amount of eosinophils found in the blood. The presence of a schistosomiasis infection can be determined by using an ELISA test to measure IgG antibodies to the schistosoma egg antigen. Praziquantel is the treatment of choice. After an initial treatment, another treatment may be needed in three to six months. I did consider many other options. Not hydatidosis, kinococcus tapeworm, as it usually causes coughing up blood and lung claps, also causes cystic lung lesions. Not dyrophiliasis, as it causes coin-like lesions that may be seen on a CT scan. Symptoms also include coughing up blood and wheezing. Not paragonomiasis, as it causes coughing up blood and pleural effusion, which would be seen on the CT scan. Best wishes, Kendra. I think, Justin, you're up for Kevin Wrights. Indeed. Sure. So, uh, Kevin Wrights from Chicago, uh, whether Zephyrs, Blue Skies, <laughs> Keening Baby Robins, etc., This 79-year-old patient's immune system is behind the eight ball in multiple ways. Transform CLL, post-recent chemotherapy for B-cell lymphoma, prolonged and inadvertently excessive corticosteroid therapy. He has multiple lesions that have been uncovered by diagnostic tests or clinical history. History of treated latent tuberculosis, history of tropical residents, uh, clinical evidence of CNS problems, cognitive slowing and altered mental status, radiographic lung and intestinal abnormalities. With all due respect to Occam's razor and the fact that this man is balanced on a pathological razor's edge, it is prudent to throw the kitchen sink at his problem. He may have multiple concurrent infections owing to the severe nature of his immune deficits. Non-infectious diseases such as lymphomatous involvement in the gut, lung, and meninges should also be considered as understudies in this scenario. Prior to introducing my leading diagnosis, opportunists to keep in mind in order of increasing taxonomic order... CMV, EBV, HSV, HBV, HCV, SC polyoma, JC virus, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, crypto, histo, blasto, candida, pneumocystis, TB, atypical TB like MAI, toxoplasma, schistosomiasis reported from the DR, reactivation schistosomiasis or even T solium reactivation in the context of organ transplant immunosuppression has been reported. However, the intersection of several areas of the clinical history can quickly reduce the shopping list. The pulmonary gut CNS involvement, absence of eosinophilia, followed by a rise after steroid discontinuation, and history of tropical residents makes disseminated strongyloides a prime consideration. Glucocorticoids greatly uh, increase the risk of hyperinfection dissemination and also deceptively lower the eosinophil count. The negative stool ONP offers no consolation as a single study has only a sensitivity of 30%, CPD6. The Ground glass opacities in the lung, a thickened intestinal wall, nonspecific CNS findings all raise a suspicion of nematode infection. Concurrent infections to consider, however, are strep bovis or E. coli bacteremia, which can accompany disseminated strongyloides. Pneumocystis gerovecchiae is also on the list, since Bactrim prophylaxis can fail due to uh, DHFR or dihydropterate synthase gene mutations that give rise to resistance. Regarding strongyloides infection, repeat stool ONP, intestinal aspirates, and ELISA may provide a definitive diagnosis. Due to the potentially fatal nature of the disease, early empiric therapy is essential, ivermectin being the drug of choice. Interested to know the outcome of this desperately ill patient? Thanking the TWIP, educa- uh, thanking the TWIP educators for your time and dedication. There's a bunch of references. Wow. Tw- Kevin always gives us references. Yeah. Very thorough. Not just that. This is a... Um this is a teaching exercise. I mean, this is great to, the way he writes out everything. Yeah. And I, I like that very much. It's very logical and very thorough. Very and, thorough. Um, 
it's almost too thorough. If I was that patient, I couldn't afford all those tests. So I'm wondering what would happen if he actually ran them. <laughs> so, William writes, hello, Twip Tumveritz. That's not right, Twip Tumveritz. Well, uh, <laughs> I guess you put the T in there. I was initially stumped by the case description from Dr. Griffin at the end of episode 154, and while I am no means certain of a diagnosis, I am excited to give it a go. Mm -hmm. Ballantidium coli seems to be a possible culprit after a close reading of Parasitic Diseases 6 and a trawl through some recent literature. According to 6E, fever is a common symptom and immunocompromised individuals such as our patient following chemotherapy and extended prednisone doses may develop invasive disease with organisms invading the lungs, urinary tract, liver, and heart. This was also supported by an article I found that lists pneumonia-like symptoms as well as cough and weight loss with B. coli infections. My main concern with this guess is that I did not hear any mention of diarrhea, which seems to be a fairly prevalent symptom. It is certainly possible for the patient to have picked up the parasite on his February trip to the DR, as B. coli can be found almost anywhere that pigs are kept in close proximity to humans and or their water sources. If this is the case, metronidazole seems to be the treatment of choice based on my initial research. Acute schistosomiasis via infection with S. mansoni, Kadayama fever, matches a few of the noted symptoms and a number of worm diseases can present with fever and headache, but I'm leaning towards my original guess to the, due to the immunocompromised nature of the host and the pneumonia-like illness that points towards a possible balantidium infection. Have a great week, William. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Eric writes, Dear TWIP hosts, with an immunocompromised patient, a whole slew of possibilities arise. Initial involvement of lung sounds like pneumocystis pneumonia, PCP, but patient was already on Bactrim prophylaxis that takes care of most PCP. Although, as was, uh, although, also, no, I'm sorry, also, was the chest x-ray consistent with PCP? Then I thought about latent TB, or atypical mycobacterium, which the patient's travel history fits. But you said the sputum smear, if it was actually sputum, showed no TB, and eosinophilia doesn't fit. What about the hyperinfect what about that hyperinfection with Strangeloides stercoralis, which you all have mentioned a few times on recent episodes? If so, we can explain the sustained fever, the lung opacities and dry cough, the colon responding to larval migration with edema, the ineffectiveness of antibiotics and antifungals, and the marked eosinophilia. In hindsight, no pun intended, Strangeloides can be diagnosed from endoscopy and biopsy too. Of the signs of strongyloidiasis, we are missing the rash caused by migrating larva. PD6 says a minority of patients have a rash, and a question of why we did not see larvae in the sputum samples. PD6 didn't mention how long it takes for the strongyloides to grow exponentially from a chronic infection to a symptomatic level of infection, or when the eosinophilia appears, but some searching reveals that two weeks is about right. <clears throat> this fits our patient's timeline. Lastly, I found an article that cites a 2016 study that found strongyloides in the Dominican Republic. I didn't have time to absolutely to be absolutely thorough, but I shall wager hyperinfection with strongyloides stercorella secondary to glucocorticoid therapy as my diagnosis. I hope the patient had or has a decent outcome. This particular case doesn't sound like a pleasant experience. Eric, Los Angeles. P.S. More questions. Are hyperinfection and disseminated strongyloidias the same term, or does it does only the latter term involve tissues aside from the lung and gut? Wouldn't the chemotherapy of the patient's lymphoma have also led to a compromised immune system? Good questions. Okay. We'll come back to them, right? You bet. Well, certainly. <clears throat> Alan writes, greetings, professors, twip. The weather here is 33C, 92F, and V-O-G-Y, the V, <laughs> on our longtime volcanic eruption has moved east and grown since May and taken some 700 homes in the past, in the last 30 days. Indeed. Have been working with healthcare for the dispa displaced refugees on the far side, and we're working on providing housing for 20 families on our campus in West Hawaii, where much of the volcanic fog seems to settle. Wow. Has been a bit too busy to get in a guest the last several episodes, but I'd still like a HB copy of PD6. <laughs> so I'll get off the guess as I'm waiting to board a flight. The patient with 103F fever, 
headache, dry cough, weight loss, and now a thickening intestinal wall sounds like they've ruled out TB, other helminths, including strong alloides. So the thickening intestinal wall makes me think he may have an active resurgence of amoeba and amoeba histolytica. Thanks for your great podcast. Miss Dixon, <laughs> Alan Who, Robbins. Alan, I missed you too. <laughs> who's, who's, who's Miss Dixon? <laughs> she won the uh, contest for it. No, I won't go into that. <laughs> I believe he missed Dixon like yes, the rest of Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah V O G Y is. Uh, He's in a hot spot. But foggy no. with a V, right? Yeah, they just had a boat accident yesterday, right? But it's I guess it's volcanic. It's a volcanic Aggie. So it's Voggy yeah, instead yeah. of Voggy. That's right. No, thanks for breaking. You know, I, I like when people mention stuff. You know, people seem to quickly lose attention, but there's a lot of people struggling in Hawaii because of this natural disaster. So. Exactly. And I appreciate you helping them out. The point is that if you build your house on top of an active volcano, now we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> Can you pass the? Um, I'm sorry. Thing there to absolutely our guest. We're up to Justin. We're up to Lana. Well, Lana. Well, so dear Twip. For case, uh, so Lana writes, Dear Twip, for case number 154 of the 79-year-old man with B-cell lymphoma, I think he has schistosomiasis, an infection of the blood fluke schistosoma mansoni. Most likely, he contracted it from contaminated fresh water populated by the transmitting snail Biomphalaria glabrata during his visit a couple of months earlier to the Dominican Republic. I'm getting the thumbs up on that pronunciation Absolutely. from Dixon. Absolutely. Perfect. Uh, for the differential diagnosis, tuberculosis has been eliminated. Ascoriasis, ancyclostomiasis, strongyloidiasis, and other parasites may also cause symptoms in the lungs, but the chest CT showing ground glass opacification suggests the formation of granulomas as an inflammatory immune response to the eggs of schistosoma. His symptoms were likely suppressed by the two-week course of prednisone he was accidentally given, becoming much worse when he went off the steroid. He was likely immunocompromised by his recent chemotherapy, but it seems like many of the symptoms are caused by the immune response to the invader. I'd like to learn more about how a weakened immune system might still wreak havoc with its inflammatory response. Prosequantil is the drug of choice. Treatment may be delayed for about six weeks after symptoms in acute cases, uh, acute cases subside to avoid possible exacerbation of symptoms. This also allows the worms to mature to a stage where the drug is effective. Treatment should be repeated in four to six weeks to ensure that newly matured adult worms are killed. This patient's symptoms don't seem to be waning, though, so this may be a chronic case. The preferred drug is still prosequantil. In chronic cases, though, the patient needs to be monitored for an acute inflammatory response to eggs in the central nervous system. Corticosteroids can protect against this during treatment. A follow-up should be done in three to six months to ensure that the infection is eradicated. Thanks, Lana in Austin, Texas. Good on you. <laughs> All right. Uh, the next one is mistakenly included because it's not about this. So we will move to Peter's, which is the last one. Uh -huh. Bonjour, Professor Twip. In haste, as my time is being consumed, showing my daughter Isobel, just because unfortunately she broke her leg and has a full cast, she can still enjoy the summer. She might even get her name called out on Twip. She just did. Yeah, However, what, a co what a coincidence. We have the full cast, too. Is that right? No kidding. Well, <laughs> we'll twip back, you know. Uh, Dixon's oh, here. Oh, oh, uh, it was a, that was a oh, bad joke. Oh, that's, I am that's an Alan Dove one. Oh. <laughs> so Holy sorry. cow. I'm sorry to hit, hear about your... I resemble that remark. <laughs> <laughs> However, I did not want to let such an interesting case go without a guess. I have not had time to consult with my lab mates, but I would guess just a semiasis. Based on the multifocal ground glass opacifications and this nice free review paper on parasitic infections in the lungs. Given the circumstances, and if I'm wrong, I hope I will be given a buy and the TCD parasitology <laughs> to keep their winning streak of nine. Wow, they've got nine in a row. That's, that's very good. Also, an idea. Could Vincent tweet when the episode ah. of TWIP has been recorded? Then listeners would know, although it might not have been put up yet their answers will not be read and they can save their powder for the next episode <laughs> it's great it would save people emailing answers between when it is recorded and uploaded allez les bleus that must be world cup stuff right something like that peter tcd parasitology you know peter i've thought about that but i'm not sure how many twip listeners are on twitter because when i post twip on Twitter, I don't yep. really get much of a response, but I, I will, in a moment, do just as you request. <laughs> that's very nice of you. We'll tweet that we are recording, and therefore no more guesses. And in fact, that's the last guess. It is. We had quite a mixture. And a wonderful guesses. response from highly qualified people. 
Yes. Isn't that cool what we get? We have great listeners. That's right? fabulous. Yeah. It's fabulous. Yep. Yeah, well, it is. Well thought out, well researched responses. You yeah. bet. You bet. Not all of them were right, however. <laughs> well, only one could be right, right. Well, there could be several right. Really? This one, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, of course, I mean, for the book, there was only one winner, but I, I think some of those uh, diagnoses could be lumped together. Let's just put it that way. Daniel, do you want to go uh, back to some of them or do you want to wait till later? Um, I guess we should start by just um, sort of adding up the different guesses we had, right? So yeah. we had a we had a number of people go with uh, strongyloides. Right. We had a few people go with schistosomiasis. Yes. We had uh, entamoeba. Um, what else did we have here? Balantidium B-coli. coli. <laughs> Balantidium coli, right. We had that. Do we have a pneumocystis okay. or that was all ruled out? People people brought it up, but I don't know if anyone really threw... Uh, but they rejected it because the patient was on Bactrim therapy, but I think um, that's the reason why they didn't mm. think it was... All right. But you know what we you know we didn't do, and I remember talking about this last time, is since Dixon wasn't around, we didn't get to hear his... Uh, his guess on you know put putting this all together. What are you what are you thinking, Dixon? Before before Justin tells us. Well, I will tell you that when I first read this after I came back and Vincent was in his office this morning, I I yelled out to him. I said, "I know what this is. It's pneumocystis because <laughs> of the ground glass lung appearance." And then I said, "Whoops! I forgot to read the last line of the case history. Thirty percent is in a that's not consistent with a pneumocystis at all." So I'm gonna go with Strangulati stercorallis hyperinfection. Are, are we allowed to do pneumocystis on you know this case now that they've sort of made it a made a it fungus. a fungus right? They, they didn't make it a fungus. <laughs> it's always been a fungus. <laughs> you now know the sixteen S RNAs recognize that it is a ribosomal fungus. RNAs show clearly that it's a fungus. So there's no mistaking what it is. Basically, they even worked out the life cycle now. Right. So I, my guess is strange ladies. I, I I I go with the majority vote on this one. And why is that, Dix? Because because I think it's very consistent with all okay. of the things that this case is. Um, Telling us. Okay. But because the serology was negative, uh, that's a bit of a caveat, but there was a really good explanation for why that might be true because this is Mm -hmm. a recent exacerbation and the IgM antibodies might have been invoked first before the IgG came in and the the test only detects IgG. But shouldn't you have a memory response, which would be IgG immediately? You know, this smolders for years and years and years. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I honestly don't. I, I would. I don't think that works. I mean, I think you would, if you have memory, if you've been infected, you would have an IgG. No, it, memory, that's probably right. Could be wrong. Probably right. But it's Actually, got a low sensitivity, though. That's got a very low sensitivity. Yeah. Before we, you know, I'm going to probably stop talking soon and, and Dr. The illustrious Dr. Justin Aaron will take over. <laughs> Indeed. But, uh, you know, when I was reading these, and this will be one of my few, you know, uh, we'll see if I keep my promise, how quiet I become. But um, I, I did want to comment about a few things people said. And it's really important, you know, that, well, I, I like to think it's really important that people take away um, a learning point from each time they listen to uh uh, one of our episodes. And in addition to learning about parasites, I also think it's important that they understand the immune system because we often ask the immune system for help when we're not sure what's going on. And one of the things we ask about are levels of IgM and IgG, so antibody or immunoglobulin levels. And so I just as a refresher, when we think through this, is one is when you're exposed to something um, for the first time, it takes about a week for a somewhat specific IgM response to be detectable in the serum. Um, and then it takes about three weeks, and this is again on average, this is variation, before we get a detectable IgG. And then the IgG response lasts for years. The IgM response in many cases will disappear after, let's say, six months. Um, so that's important to think about. But again, when we ask the immune system to help us in an individual who's been on steroids and has CLL, which is a, a cancer a malignancy of the B cells that we're, we're asking, you need to start saying, boy, how much can I trust what I hear from Tweedledum and Tweedledee in this context? All right. So, Justin, what happened here? Yeah. So I think just to uh, kind of elaborate on what Daniel was just saying to give a little more background to interpret the information we're going to get um, so this gentleman actually carried the diagnosis of CLL for several years and had seen multiple chemotherapy regimens prior to this. And it actually, this was um, not his first regimen, even for the transformed lymphoma as well. So in addition to the 
hematologic malignancy itself that can have an effect on his immune system. Um, he'd seen a lot of drugs, um, you know, that uh, would further weaken his immune system um, and potentially uh, lower antibody levels to things that uh, he's seen in the past. So to go through kind of the sequence of events for him, even though we mentioned the colonic wall thickening that was seen on the CAT scan, um, because he had become constipated and developed something that we call an ileus where the intestines seemed to have fallen asleep, he initially had an upper endoscopy to look for something that might be kind of blocking where the stomach was going into the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine. And it was on that biopsy that uh, we received a call from uh, the gastroenterology uh, fellow who had done the case, who had gotten a call from the pathologists that they saw um, some interesting findings on uh, on the pathology um, that uh, I'm looking for my notes for exactly what we saw. Um, yes, yeah, so there was numerous uh, nematodes in uh, all of the egg, larva, and adult worm forms. And uh, the appearance was favoring a diagnosis of strongyloides. And about a day after we got this information back from the pathology, he started having bowel movements again, and we were able to send for an ovum parasite to our microbiology lab, and then we're able to confirm through more, I guess, conventional methods of uh, mm-hmm. being able to visualize the larvae directly mm-hmm. in our own microbiology lab as well. So, right. so strongyloides uh, uh, was the the correct diagnosis. If we can, I add to that, please, because it's a direct follow up. No question about it. If you look on page two hundred and forty three, you will see with figure twenty point two b a biopsy of the small intestine in which strongyloides is present, and you'll notice that it's uh, intramulticellular. This parasite lives in the same niche as the adult of Trichinella. It's not a luminal dwelling parasite. It lives in a multicellular niche inside the uh, colon or epithelium that it penetrates in. And if you take a fresh biopsy rather than an autopsy biopsy, which in the, lo- uh, in the early days they were saying, well, it's got to be a luminum dwelling parasite because, look, we always find them in the lumen of patients that, of course, died from this infection, right? This is a living patient. These worms are fresh, and the, the, and the biopsy shows exactly where they live. So this is... There's nothing else that lives there except trichinella. So you either have to say it's trichinella or it's strangeloides, and this doesn't look anything like trichinella. So it's it's by definition, by elimination of just the other parasite, it's got to be strangeloides. So it's a it's a perfect follow up, and this is a PNS uh, histopathology s- section, by the way. So uh, it's it's a perfect follow up to what you're saying. By the way, the the ones with the PDF versions have the same figure, mm-hmm. so you don't need a hard <laughs> copy. <laughs> well, I'm sure they would love to have your. No, that's a, <laughs> that's true. Well, that's I, I'm not going to object to that at all. Of course, I'd be glad to provide it. So, what did you do next? Yeah, so we were a little bit taken by surprise, although we probably should not have been, because um, the mm-hmm. you know in, in retrospect, the course followed such a. Uh, uh, a good story for uh, a hyperinfection or, or a dissemination of strongyloides uh, infection in this patient because, you know, we had the negative serology, but in an immunocompromised host, you can't necessarily rely on that. And we were, you know, right. exploring other diagnoses like right. tuberculosis, which we, we, you know, ruled out as well. So in this case, once we finally got this information, we uh, started him on oral ivermectin. However, because of the difficulty with uh, going to the bathroom with this ileus, he actually had a a feeding tube, what we call an NG tube for a nasogastric tube, um, going into his stomach that they had to suction. So we were having a hard time giving him meds Mm. from uh, from above, which kind of very, very much complicates the administration of ivermectin, which is really the drug of choice in this case. And you're left with kind of a a couple options. there is uh, um, a number of case reports of giving subcutaneous uh, ivermectin, which actually is a veterinary preparation. It's not a preparation that was um, uh, manufactured and designed for administration to humans right. um, to be given in cases where you don't have enteral or access to the GI tract. However, that is a bit logistically challenging because that's obviously not a medication that we carried uh, in right. the hospital. Right. Um So what we ended up doing, because despite how sick he was, he was actually relatively stable. And there actually are a couple of case reports of doing this as well. Um, We gave him uh, uh, ivermectin that was mixed into a a solution and gave it to him as an enema rectally, um, which allows for some systemic absorption. And on top of that, because there are some concerns that you might not get adequate levels that way, we were also giving him albendazole orally for as much as we could kind of in between uh, suctioning the Uh, the NG tube. And then once the 
ileus improved in the span of a few days, um, we and he started having bowel movements, we were able to start giving him the ivermectin by mouth, um, which uh, along with the albendazole, right. uh, which we continued uh, in conjunction um, for a period of about two weeks until he had had uh, negative ONPs for. I think about um, seven to ten days. Um, at that point in time, we were getting ONPs every two to three days. And his, ili- and his eosinophilia started to fall. His eosinophilia started to fall. His uh, fevers improved as well. Um, what was interesting in his course uh, around the time that we made the diagnosis, uh, I mentioned he was a little bit confused when he first came in, but he was seeming more and more confused. And in uh, you know. Um, mm. Uh, a patient who's in the hospital for a long time and ill, you know, there was concerns that this could just be delirium, which we see sometimes in, in patients, especially who are older and have a number of health issues. Uh, but that had worsened. So we recommended getting a spinal tap on him and it actually was consistent with having a bacterial meningitis and grew a uh, bacteria called enterococcus, which is right. typical. So someone mentioned, I think, E. coli in the blood and, and E. coli meningitis um, is, is kind of frequently been associated with strongylitis sure, in the past. Sure. But this is a different GI bug that's actually a gram positive, not yeah. a gram negative, that presumably entered his spinal fluid from uh, a consequence of the dissemination of the strongylitis. So how did you address that problem? So that he was put on uh, antibiotics to treat intravenously, intravenously. To, to treat uh, okay. the meningitis and as that well. went down. That improved okay. as well. So I have a question about that because it's always been a controversy of eosinophils versus neutrophils. So, so did he have a shift to the left in his uh, blood pattern? Uh, so when he first came into the hospital, he had a neutrophilic predominance. Uh-huh. Um, and that was while he was still on the high dose of prednisone. And then several days into the hospital course, while the fevers were ongoing, we had a rise in the eosinophilia as the steroids kind of washed out of his That's system. And so we, we do see that, you know, that the, the steroids yeah. produce more of the neutrophilic response and can mask the eosinophilia. And in this case, it kind of emerged. The spinal fluid, because um, that would have been the interesting question, you know, if you're invoking, are we having parasites actually entering the, the nervous system? Are there sure. eosinophils there as well? But his differential was was just overwhelmingly neutrophilic, I think because of the bacterial infection that was going on. So they didn't see yeah. or didn't report any eosinophils in the uh, in the cerebrospinal fluid. Right. Because because the, if the body has to choose between eosinophils and neutrophils, and you've got two different processes going on at the same time, what you do is strongyloides, the body always chooses the neutrophils to, to knock out the bacteria or try to. And for that reason, the eosinophilia goes to zero, and you've still got strongyloides. So I was curious as to how this 30% played out. And if you had done nothing, of course, then it would have been a disaster because he would have died from a bacteremia, I presume. But um, it's always a, a, a clever uh, way of thinking about bone marrow function when you think of both of these cells come from the same stem cell line. And then they differentiate once they get off on the tracks of whatever is inducing them, right? And the different interleukins are are responsible for both those neutrophil and eosinophil responses. So it's gotten much more complicated since I learned this, of course, because there's too many neutroph- there's too many uh, interleukins now. I think we should eliminate some of them because otherwise <laughs> people of my age will not be able to keep up with this literature. <laughs> you know, now, you, I take off you, my shoes when I want to count interleukins. If you eliminate now. them, you're going to have even more problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you know, I only have so many fingers. <laughs> so the, il- the, the ileus is a consequence of the uh, presence of, of worms? Yeah, so the... Biopsy, in addition to showing the worms, there was um, like acute on chronic inflammation in both the stomach and the intestines. And so presumably just mm. the ongoing worsening of the parasitic infection um, in the bowel had led him to just develop this ileus in, in the setting of, of acute okay. illness. We see ileus for non-infectious reasons um, mm. as well. But in this case, I think knowing okay. that biopsy. So were you worried about C. difficile by any chance? We were. Um, and, you know which is C. difficile uh, is most commonly associated with diarrhea, but actually yes. can present as an ileus and in its most severe form, something called toxic megacolon, um, which is can be a surgical emergency. Um, his uh, abdominal x-rays didn't show that degree of mm. dilation of his bowel. So we weren't as concerned about that. And um, I believe he may or may not have been tested for C. diff when he first came in, and we were trying to figure out where the fevers were coming from before he developed right. the ileus. Yep. Um, so it was lower on our, our differential at that Got point it. in time. So sometimes uh, Ascaris, if that's present, and a lot of them, a bolus, can actually block the small intestine, and it causes uh, stasis. And then you get C. difficile right behind that because the anaerobiasis kicks in and this germinates and becomes a big problem. 
without anybody else's help except the Ascaris. So it's, you know, this is fascinating biology in the gut, right? Right. So Justin, would you expect him to be free of worms after treatment? Yeah, so that's a, a really good question. So, you know, uh, he, despite how severe this presentation was, it probably does fall on the hyperinfection spectrum, but probably a relatively milder case to compare to some other cases we've seen in reports in the literature yeah. where, you know, mortality has been described in excess of, I think, 80% in, in mm-hmm. some case series. Um, but the burden of worms is so high that I believe there's been a couple of papers published recently that when they start using PCR-based testing to kind of look for evidence of strongyloides, they kind of find people continuously mm. positive. And, you know, to say that that's all dead worms is a little bit uh, yeah, probably naive just with, sorry. you know, the life cycle. There's probably some worms that survive mm. sure. the treatments. And so um, what we ended up doing for him is after the two weeks of combined albendazole and ivermectin, you know, via numerous routes, um, once we felt that he had clinically improved and his uh uh, his stool ONPs had turned negative. Uh, we started to put him on weekly ivermectin with kind of a plan to do that indefinitely. Mm. Um, just given that he still had a significant level of immunocompromise from his underlying malignancy from his prior chemotherapy. And with the plan that if he were ever to go back on chemo or get steroids again, that we'd actually probably put him back on, yeah. on daily just because, you know, right. he was lucky to survive this initial That's episode right. and next time might not be so lucky. And there's no way to know where he caught this or when he caught this. It's probably that he caught it in the Dominican Republic, but when he could have had this for 20 years, right? He could have caught it as a kid and maintained it as a smoldering, uh, auto infection that didn't result yeah, in hyperinfection. Yeah, yeah. So, a do lot you, of cases with this one. Do you think if the steroids hadn't been uh, overdosed, he would not have had this issue? Ah, good question. It's a very interesting question because you know I think we were operating operating under the the presumption, like Dixon just said, that he might have been infected from many years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's cases of people many decades out That's seeming right. to to still uh, harbor the parasite. That's right. Um, and he'd gotten a lot of chemotherapy previously, and a lot of those regimens contain prednisone. Mm-hmm. So what was different this time yeah. is a little That's right. unclear, but it was a longer duration of a higher dose of prednisone. Mm-hmm. And while other types of immunosuppression have been associated with strongyloides reactivation, steroids probably have the most you know, quantity of literature, um, you know, showing the association there and, and, you know, the effect of high dose steroids on the immune system is probably just stronger, uh, a stronger risk factor for strongyloides, uh, yeah. reactivation mm-hmm. than, than the other chemotherapy regimens he'd had. Right. Yeah. I would, I would also say one of the unique things about prednisone is not only impacting the immune system, but it actually impacts the, uh, strongyloides life cycle. And so the strongyloides in general, right? When you have, um, someone infected, you're, you're going from an L1 to an L2, L3, the L2 will pass out, but if it will convert from the L2 to L3, um, from the rubidiform to the filariform while still inside a person, then this sets up this cycle of hyperinfection. And the prednisone at high doses can accelerate the L2 to L3 maturation. So you're, you're doing two things with the steroids. Um, all the chemo is, is compromising the immune system, but the steroid is also accelerating that um, progression to the auto-infective stage. So Daniel, you're in, are you insinuating that the I am insinuating <laughs> <laughs> that the prednisone actually has a biological effect on the worm. If you could do this in vitro, you'd get a faster L2 to L3. Actually, yeah, that that is what I'm insinuating. And the timing, you- um, and actually the clinical cases I've seen, this 10 to 14 days, it takes a period of time of the um, exposure of the strongyloides um, to see this to see this sort of acceleration. So is there is there evidence, experimental evidence that supports that contention? I think we actually reference it in our book. Um, yeah, Gee. I will. I, I will. I'm going to check that while you guys are chatting. Because uh, because uh, my assumption was always that if prednisolone or prednisone inhibits the immune system, the immune system has a grip on the developmental cycle of this parasite, and the moment you interrupt that grip, you're going to get an acceleration of this parasite's uh, uh, migrate of of, of of transformation from an l2 to an l3 the same is true for trichinella by the way if uh, you immunosuppress uh, an animal that's in the process of eliminating the adult parasites they don't eliminate them and the parasites go into to long to long live or long lived uh infection so i think developmental control uh, of parasite development is under the control of the immune system 
And we don't understand the, bi- the biology of the worms well enough to know what immune effects are affecting in terms of secreted products by the adults or the larvae or that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm still skeptical as to whether the prednisone has a direct effect on the biology of the parasite. I think it's an indirect effect. I would respectfully disagree with my colleague on the left. Dr. Aaron, are you going to, are you going to jump in on this? <laughs> I, I can't say that I can comment specifically on that. I'll have to defer to, uh, 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 this, uh, this expert panel, the word, the world literature as it exists, because transurolase is a tricky infection to work with, even in vitro. It's got a lot of risk factors associated with it, namely that a lot of investigators that have worked on this actually caught it, so yeah. because they're very aggressively uh, infectious. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical as to whether it has yeah. a direct effect on the biology or, or whether it's still an immune effect. The immune system, in its full blown pattern slows down the development of this parasite so it only produces l2s before they exit the host that's what i'm that's i'm i'm sticking to that story yeah and let's um, put we'll put it out to our listeners um they can jump in and let us know if they know, think there's maybe we should crowdsource this and whoever <laughs> whichever one wins the most we'll get a free lunch at uh, you know maybe nathan's down at Coney Island or something like that. Okay, I've got to go down there right, and visit the new aquarium. So I'm oh, taking you up. I'll on, go with you. I'll go with you. Aquarium? Yeah, they got a shark tank. That's really supposed I, to be I fabulous. Should, yeah, I shouldn't say it's new. What it is is it's, an, it's a rebirth. The oldest, yeah, the oldest aquarium, I believe, in the United States. That's right. And they just built this like $200 million shark pavilion. Correct. Which is extraordinary. That's right. And your and, buddy there uh, from the from the wildlife, what's his name? The guy we did the twip. Paul, Paul Kelly is down there. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he must be involved. Right, right, yeah. right, right, right. All right. But interesting, you know, as old as this subject is, it's brand new. So that's that's what's great about uh, giving this case. Daniel, did you want to go back to any of Gavin's points? Uh, let's see. So Gavin was, which number was Gavin? Number six. Number six. Let's see what he was saying here that we had. Okay, so um, as far as pneumocystis, right, which um, – you know, I, I just to warn everyone, maybe I'll throw a pneumocystis case in because it's kind of on the edge there, right? <laughs> it was <laughs> once. Um, but you can see almost any chest X-ray. You can see a completely clear chest X-ray. You can see um, ground glass. You can see a lot of different patterns. And the presentation, also interesting enough, is quite different between what we see in the HIV population and what we see in other populations that develop this. Right. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting issue. Um, we'll see what he said. Yeah, he had a lot of different things he mentioned in here. What I feel like we probably should do is a lot of people mentioned schistosomiasis, and and why is this not schistosomiasis? Yeah, right. That's a good question. Right. That's right. So, um, who should who should feel that? Let's have you, um, Dixon. Tell us why you don't think it's schistosomiasis. Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, first of all, you'd have bleeding in the GI tract. Um, you you would from the eggs exiting at the time. Uh, the stool exam should have detected eggs if the parasites are there in that abundance to cause that much uh, symptomatology. Uh, and the transmission rate in the Dominican Republic for schisto is very, 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 very low. Very unlikely. And to harbor it for that length of time and then to have it triggered by prednisolone, I don't, or prednisone, I keep saying prednisolone, but prednisone, yeah. is, is not consistent with schistosomiasis at all. So yeah. that's for those reasons I'd say no, and the biopsy and I, didn't show it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you want to you, know, you want to call a parasite a parasite when you see it. You've got to tell us what it is, and uh, it did say what it was. So uh, I think schisto is not a consistent diagnosis. And I think the other to just and I'm just really repeating other things people said is that you know I've seen in my personal experience I think 60 years was the longest from time of exposure to uh, oh, right. strong goloides and in the literature it's I think 75 years so yeah. um, this is something that persists I mean Schisto lives a long time too 20 to 30 years but the eosinophilia would have been there before he came into the hospital Yeah, he came in with no eosinophilia and developed well, it but he came in on steroids so we don't necessarily know about his eosinophilia prior to going We never went steroids. back to his other records. So actually, he did have a low-level eosinophilia that had gone on uh, intermittently uh, um, over the past probably, yeah, like, yeah, couple steroid. of years that he was in our he health did, system. Right. He, uh, not to this you know, degree yeah. of elevation, but something that had, I think, not been fully worked out. So I consider this guy highly lucky because if you hadn't screwed up on the dose 
he still would have had strongyloides in it and was still at risk for hyperinfection. And you gave him an incorrect dose, which triggered the hyperinfection and caused him to come back to the hospital. And at that point, you had a diagnosis. You knew what was causing this, but before that, you didn't. So I, I, I don't say you should always screw up, but, uh, but this was a, um, a correctable mistake, which led to a correct diagnosis and a treatment which uh, solved one of his many problems. If this hadn't happened, what would have been the consequence? Well, he would have gone, I mean, he's 79 years old, so who knows how much longer he was going to live anyway, especially with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. But every time he got treated for, for leukemia, he got the steroids mm-hmm. to avoid the, uh, the cytokine rush that gets with cell death uh, uh, syndrome. So. Every time that would have happened, he would have gotten another yeah. spike of of uh, strange right. Oh, and here, here I'm going to jump in mm. um, because I found some literature to support my comment. Oh, <laughs> good. Okay, couple, I'm good. Couple, this is good. Couple papers. This is Apparently, good. what they what these um, studies are showing is the structural similarities of the steroids to the natural parasite ecdysteroids. Um, is what may be it's a molting trans- hormone. It's a molting trans- hormone. Yeah, so yeah. it may be accelerating the transformation of rebdidiform That's larvae. Fascinating. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, so that that yeah, is interesting. Cool. So there's a couple of studies here cool. showing that. Okay. Suggesting it, supporting the contention. Okay, it's a steroid-like effect. Uh, 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 oh no, I'm yeah. to say something else. Ecdyson. Yeah, ecdyson. Yeah, That's right. It's a molting hormone. Uh, Daniel Eric had asked, are hyperinfection and disseminated strongyloidiasis the same term, or does the latter term involve tissues aside from the lung and gut? Wouldn't chemotherapy have also led to a compromised immune system? Yeah. I, no, I mean, that leads into the same thing, is that, yes, um, I, I consider them to be basically the same. I, in, do too. A, I do, too. Yeah, in a normal host, low-level exposure, et cetera, et cetera, they're, they're not going to invade, they're not going to disseminate, you're not going to get hyperinfection dissemination. Okay. Same, same thing in my mind. The other is that, yes, um, any immune suppression, any chemotherapy can... Um, increase your risk, but there does seem to be something special about steroids, which I think is this special okay. L2, L3. What about, a, what about another immunosuppressive agent like de- dexamethasone or something else, which doesn't have this similarity in structure? Uh, how would that play out in a, an experimental infection? Because you can infect dogs with this as well. They must have done these studies sometime. Yeah, no, I, I think, I mean, I think all the mineral and glucocorticoids, so whether it's prednisone, prednisolone, dexamethasone, I, I think you're going to have a, a similar risk. But I think clinically, because um, prednisone is used so much, yeah, that it, we're, we're seeing an association. So. Got it. All right. All right. Let's um, – I'm certainly going to read more about that. <laughs> let's, pick a, let's pick a book winner. Sure. We had um, 13 guesses. A lot of guesses. This is the most guesses but, I think we've had. I wonder why. I think – Maybe we're, maybe we're catching on. <laughs> maybe the the uh, the health world has woken up or waken up to our uh, podcast. All right, we're num- uh, one thirteen. We're going to pick a random number between one and thirteen. I'm going to push the button, and you the number is Let's number ten. Let's see who number ten is, Eric. 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 Uh, from Los Thanks. Angeles. So, Eric, you're the winner. Send me your address to. Uh, Twip at microbe.tv. So Eric actually got the diagnosis correct as well. Very nice. He did. Hyperinfection by strongyloides, secondary cool. to glucotherapy, uh, glucocorticoid therapy. Yes, sir. There you go. Now, I would like to, before we go on to uh, a hero, uh, no, we're going to do a little, a little paper because Daniel needs to leave in about 22 minutes. Right. <laughs> but, um, More or less. I, w- I, want I, to- I have to go sailing. Yeah, I understand. That's right. This no is problem. important. <laughs> no, no. This is, it. this is important. We'll make sure we finish our We'll finish our it. Uh, first, the first thing I want to do is ask um, Justin to just tell us about your training. Where are you from originally? Yeah, so I'm from Long Island originally, uh-huh. uh, from Huntington, uh, which is out on the border of yep. Nassau and Suffolk County. Right. Um, I uh, went to undergraduate at Brandeis University outside of yeah. Boston oh, nice. and then came back to New York ever since then. I did my medical school um, up in the Bronx at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, mm-hmm. um, where I took a, a parasitology course uh, taught by the uh, uh, great and outstanding teacher, Dr. Christina Coyle, um, here too. who is still 
teaches here and actually lectures our division and, and right. is a, a frequent um, uh, person that I contact for challenging cases. Good deal. And then for my internal medicine residency, I came here to Columbia, stayed here for fellowship, and uh, now um, in my second year as a, a faculty member. Fabulous. As well. And so you, you're going to stay here for the foreseeable future? Is that the plan? Uh, there's no imminent yeah. plans to, to leave. I mean, anything is possible in the future, but uh, I kind of just got mm-hmm. here in my new role. And so I'm not uh, yeah. itching to leave just yet. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Right. And uh, at what point in your life did you decide you wanted to be a doctor? Uh, I had a general idea. I was kind of always like, you know, a, a, a science kid, you know, going through elementary school, grade school, and kind of got very interested in biology uh, mm. uh, growing up and kind of did the whole pre-med thing uh, during um, uh, during undergraduate and, you know, came in already with that idea and took some physiology yeah. courses and things like that that really fascinated me and, yeah, and yeah. sent me along this, this tract. Well, Infectious disease was actually later in the game, but that just came, you know, uh, I like that everything gets infected. You know, you can become like <laughs> a, a, a specialist in, in doing surgery on the left pinky toe, but, right. um, you know, everyone, everything gets infected. And also a lot of what we get asked with fevers or, or whatever the, the problem is in, in an intensive care unit patient, it's not even necessarily infectious. So you have right. to think outside the box a lot. You're right. So. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. Sure. Thank you for having me. So this paper was suggested out on Twitter. So um, I thought we'd talk about it because the person who posted it said, does this mean a threat to humans? And that's really the that's question, a great question that I wanted to address. That's it's a wonderful question. It, it's, I don't, can't tell if you're serious or not. No, it's, Are you serious? I am serious. <laughs> Absolutely. Because sometimes you do have humor. I do, but this isn't one of those moments. This was published in Bio One, Journal of Parasitology. Sorry. Journal of Parasitology. Right. And it's called Prevalence, Structure, and Distribution of Novel Parasite Cysts Containing Dracunculus Species in River Otters from Arkansas. Right. The authors are Tumlison and Cerf. And this is a very straightforward study. Indeed. So in Arkansas, they hunt otters for their pelts. They do. And these individuals took the carcasses and they wanted to see... What, what kinds of uh, parasites were in them, I think. Exactly. Right? They were doing a survey. That's right. I guess I would say they trap them. They're not, not really, I think of hunting, right? It's going out trap. with your bow and arrow. Yeah, they, or tra- <laughs> they tra- trap. No, they <laughs> trap. They trap them. That's true. And That's so true. There, I guess here there is um, the literature reports of infection by guinea worms usually regard taxonomy, geographic location, host, or veterinary treatment. We found no reports of cysts with an enumeration of multiple individuals or prevalence among lives. So that's why they wanted to do this study. And they found, they, they looked at, um, well, there, there are previous people who have looked at these carcasses. Yeah, and but in Canada, though, right? One of them was in Canada. Ottawa. Uh, one of them was in Alabama, Massachusetts, yep. Yep. Ontario. And they have found previously worms in these carcasses. Right. And so they examined skinned carcasses of 184 otters harvested during the December-January harvest of 2013 and 2014. 29 of them, 15% were infected by Dracunculus. Right. And, and they say no males were found to allow morphological identification. Yes. But they used PCR to do that. Dixon, why do you need the males for that? Because that's how the species is determined. I'll tell you how ah, that works. Yes, do. Yes, so male nematodes of a certain group have something called spicules. Mm-hmm. And these spicules have uh, definitive shapes. It's more or less like looking at the genitalia of mosquitoes. Believe it or not, the genitalia of mosquitoes is species-specific. And each one of them has a different morphology. So you can speciate based just on the morphology. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so in this case, the spicules of the male Dracunculus will tell you which one it is. Got it. In Cygnus, or there are several others, uh, including Metanensis, but we don't have Dracunculus Metanensis in this country. We do not. In fact, it's not in North America. It's not even in South America. So it's it's mostly an African and Asian mm-hmm. infection, mm-hmm. right? So, so we don't have a risk of catching this particular species of, of Dracunculus, whether it was the one infecting raccoons or the one infecting otters. So in this case, it was... Without the male, you won't be able to see these spicules because that's okay. a male-specific organ. Justin, you ever seen a dracunculus infection? I have not seen it. Yeah. 
That I've seen would, pictures. It would be <laughs> rare to see someone coming into the OR or the ER rather with a stick and a worm in it and sticking in their well, foot. Well, didn't we have a recent case on TWIP, Daniel, of a dracunculus? We did. We had actually to, to bring back Chris Coyle. It was a patient that uh, Chris Coyle and I was managing, and but they were living in um, Queens. So, so I right. was I do peripherally. Remember. The question was, how, how do we get someone <laughs> do to, treat to, to twist the stick every day? <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> you know, and I of course was like, I'll drive to Queens and twist the stick every day. But eventually, <laughs> it got taken care of. But yeah, he came from uh, South Sudan, where right. I don't even think there were any cases this last year. I mean, the the yeah, um, the whole program, thanks to the Carter Center and uh, uh, the people that really jumped, the, the the Guinea Worm Eradication Program has yep. uh, really progressed and is doing um, That's fantastically. True. That's true. So they found cysts in these animals on the dorsal aspect of the wrists and ankles. Right. They were oval, and when opened, they say they found them to exude a very slick fluid. Right. Uh, one of them went r- deep into the joint, and these contained worms. Yes. A lot of worms. A lot of like worms. Like 19 in some cases. Two to 19 That's right. worms. They have a picture of them here. Yep. Now, is this typically how this works? No. Not in humans. It is Not in humans. No, it's usually just one. One, right? But in this case, the otters are voracious eaters they consume mm. i will tell you each otter out west consumes five trout per day how do i know that <laughs> <laughs> gee small world they actually had a river out in colorado that they reintroduced otters to and they said otter recovery program and stupid me another friend of mine and i went fishing there expecting to catch trout that's not going to happen because the otters are very good at chasing down trout and eating them so you get five trout a day per otter and, and they eat other things too they eat snakes uh, water snakes. They also eat uh, other cold-blooded vertebrates like uh, frogs. That's what they suggest these uh, otters eat. They own. That's right. So the frogs eat copepods. The tadpoles eat. The co- tadpoles eat the copepods. They transform to adult frogs. They still have them inside, and then they, they get caught by a, an otter, and then, then the they transfer the infections. It. That's right. So and then, you can have multiple mm-hmm. infections like that. Now, in the otter, yes, they're going to release eggs, right? Larvae. Uh, eventually, but they have to mate first, right? Mm. So in order to make larvae, you have to have sex first. So somewhere in the body of the otter, the male and female dracunculus find each other. Now, how that happens, nobody has a clue because no one's ever actually done those experiments where you, you could radio label them or you mm-hmm. could put in green fluorescent procaine maybe and, and check out to see where mating actually occurs. No one has, no one knows. But as I used to say to our medical students, I said, the male of the species after mating passes out. <laughs> or dies. Did they one laugh? of those two things. Did they laugh at that? Some of them did, and some of the women medical students took offense at that, actually. But uh, I, I didn't pay attention to that. Well, that's I, microaggression. Yeah. I, I, yeah, right. So the point is that the male worms won't be in the lesions because yeah. they don't participate in that part of the life cycle. Yeah, you, so, lived, you lived in an ancient era, Dick. So. Yeah, I know. After they mate, then the larvae can be produced, and they, they're born ovoviviparously, so they're born right. live. And where do they go? They go into the blister that's created at the, at right. the source of the head. The oh, the vulva of this uh, female worm is mm-hmm. very close to the oral cavity. So where the blister is, where it creates this blister, you, you'll have a pool of larvae swimming around in the blister, basically. And so as the, mm-hmm. as the blister encounters the water, this is in human infection mm-hmm. now, the, it creates a hypertonic solution. The water goes into the blister and swells up, and eventually it bursts open and releases the larvae. Right. right. I don't know what the life cycle of this parasite is in an otter. I don't know. Mm. Because the otter is in the water 90% of its life. Right. It right. lives there. So how can these things be forming and then breaking? They can't be. It just doesn't Well, they say well. they migrate. They get fertilized. They migrate to the extremities. Yeah, they the do. Females lie under the fascia. Right. With the posterior end near the wrists or ankles, there they perforate the skin. They create an ulceration. Right. And when that, then they say after contact with water, the the uterus ruptures and releases larvae. But you, they're always in the water. Exactly. So I, I don't quite so get that. It must be as soon as the blister develops, it's released because it happens very fast, probably. Yeah, they do. They do find ulcerations, and they these are in areas with no hair. They think they're scratching because I guess right. these things itch. Right. And it's interesting too mm-hmm. that these worms actually coil up. And stay in these little nodules because yeah. in humans, they don't do that at yeah, all. Right, right. They stay in these long 
serpiginous lesions that go all the way up to your knee sometimes, and right. that's one worm. So mm-hmm. it's it's quite a different life cycle and quite a different biology. They also say they, they find a different number of cysts in – they have an unequal distribution right. between the front and back legs. Yeah, yeah. And they say they – Maybe because they have their back legs in the water longer, but uh, you said they're in the water all the time. I don't know water. about that. They're always chasing down right. something to so, eat. So, what is the risk of this for people? Zero? Zero, absolutely. So, this Dracunculus species, which, by the way, is Dracunculus, what? Um, it's not Insignus, it's the other one. It is, yeah, it's not, it, it, Dracunculus lutre. That's the one. This will not infect people. No. Never been observed to infect people. Not that I know of. Not that I know of. All right. You know what I what I thought was interesting actually made me sort of you know look into this a little bit more was I think most people have this vision, um, and our book does really address this. But the idea that an individual only gets infected with a single worm, right? Yeah, sort of right. This idea, mm-hmm. right? I mean, this is this, oh, it's one female worm and somehow one male worm and somehow they made the male goes away, um, does whatever he does, but has um, fertilized the female and then the female goes through this life cycle. But the it, the interesting thing is back when, when there were enough cases in humans to study this, um, there were some studies in Chad where actually people don't just get a single infection. You can end right. up with That's multiple true. worms. Yeah, that's true. And and I think that way, way back when there was a higher um, burden of this disease in certain areas, that was more common. And as time has gone by with these eradication efforts and you're seeing less infections, you're also seeing um, less multiple infections. Less multiple. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah that's true. So, but I, I think that's interesting because I, I was visioned, you know, like, oh, it's it's somehow. But then you think about the biology. How, how could it be one worm? So it, you know. Right. It it obviously well, had to be. There's you know, another at least possi- two, right? There's another, at least yeah, two, of course, of female. course. Yeah, but if you swallowed one copepod that had several larvae in it, and each one was a male or female, and you you drank the water, which is what happens. You know, you go into a step well, the blister breaks, the worms come out, the larvae. You scoop up that water, and in it are the copepods, and then it might be three days walking back to your village. With the water, that's time for the copy pots to ingest the larvae and to start the life cycle. And then by the time you get the water and, and everybody's drinking it, it might take two weeks for the water to be drunk by mm. all the people because they're very conservative with that stuff. Um, that's enough to allow the life cycle to develop. It's, you must have had multiple worms, but only one or two show up because maybe the first ones in stimulate mm. an immune response, which prevents the others from establishing. And the tapeworm... Biology actually works that way. So we have some precedents for thinking that might be the case here. But in the wildlife versions of these, which are less debilitating and which are more accommodated by the, the, the hosts, the otters apparently aren't very much affected by this infection. They don't develop these ulcerated lesions or damaged joints or arthritic kind of conditions that results from calcified worms. Um, this is a totally different infection in them. It sounds to me like you're comparing uh, rabies in a bat to rabies in a person. Uh, bats, no problem. People forget about it. So I think you've got a, a big difference here in terms of biology. Yeah, and I think it's important to think each copepod, and they've done studies on this, they do not have a single larvae, but they have no, multiple right. exactly. larvae. So exactly. you know, even if it's just one copepod that you ingest because no, you're no, trying to be you're super right. careful, you're getting a, a multiple Daniel, exposure. Right. So what happened to the other worms? That's a great question, right? Mm-hmm. It is. So maybe it's all the, the immune system. <laughs> maybe the first one in it could be. It's possible, or the, or the worm itself, you know, might want to keep down the competition. So that maybe when they mature, they produce a substance which prevents the others from developing further. That's not a far-fetched idea. So there are examples of that in biology. So we have to consider all the possibilities here because we don't know. Now, Daniel, do you want to do your uh, case before Dixon does his um, hero? That way, you can rush out at six p.m. No, no. Let's. I. I don't want to miss Dixon doing his hero. <laughs> well, this right. is. I don't want you to miss your race. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't. We don't want you to finish last. <laughs> okay. But because we love bragging about you, because we know that you're you're on our hero list as well. All right. Make so, us proud. Tell us about the hero. <laughs> I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that. Okay. So today's hero is none other than Charles Donovan, M.D., who lived from 1863 to 1951. 
1951, that's a long life. This, this man led a, a long and useful life. And he's best known for having identified the amasticotes of an infectious agent in spleen and white blood cells obtained from a young boy suffering from Kala Azar. It was a condition widely known, but of unknown etiology in India, while working with the British Medical Service in Madras, India. He wrote up his results and submitted them to the British Medical Journal. That was in 1903. Three years earlier, in 1900, William Boog Leishman had made similar observations from a British soldier in Dum Dum, West Bengal, India, and wrote a description nearly identical to the one generated by Donovan. Leishman also submitted his findings to the British Medical Journal back in England. Ronald Ross, then editor of that publication, deduced that each physician had discovered the exact same entity. Slides sent to him by Donovan confirmed the diagnosis as a new parasitic infection. Ross named it Leishmania Donovani in order of both physicians, which created a storm of controversy in England because Boog was, uh, or rather Leishman, was a, 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 an officer in the British Army. And as a result, uh, probably was a member of the Royal Society, a, a tropical Royal Society, and as a result had full support because his article was submitted first. Why wasn't he given full credit for the discovery of this parasite? Well, because he had misidentified it and he didn't realize that it was a, it was a Lishmania parasite. He thought it was something else, a pyroplasm. So when the final result came, Ross uh, was sort of the Solomon involved in this uh, decision-making process and, and ruled in favor of both of them rather than create uh, some biasness with regards to that, which is remarkable considering his own past. Another thing about Donovan, which is interesting because I did some reading about him just before this show went on air, is that in his later life, after all of this stuff had died down, he, he remained active and he was best known for his identification of moths and butterflies throughout the British hmm. uh, Isles and published books on the subject and was a naturalist of some note. So a, a multifaceted person with great interests in various things ended up living the rest of his life in England after having returned from the India uh, Medical Service as a, as a physician. Uh, quite a character, quite a, and a, and a wonderful personality. He never really got angry at Leishman at all. He didn't participate in that argument at all. And uh, and again, uh, he turns out to be one of our heroes. So, so there you go. All right. Thank you, Dixon. I think you have a picture of him on the wall out there, don't you? I do. And in fact, on page 194 in the book, there's also another picture. One. I do. I do. I do. You know, he has all these pictures of parasitologists on the That's wall right. out there. He found them in a garbage he bin did. here. At the, you know, someone was throwing them all That's out. That's incredible, isn't it? You're so, lucky there wasn't banana on them. <laughs> I'm lucky there wasn't or a mustard, lot of other things. Or mustard. It's a wall right. of fame. <laughs> exactly. Dan, uh, Daniel. Are you, is everybody ready for a new case? We lay, are. Lay it on us. Okay. Now, this is another, I'm going to say, it's another challenging one. So, I, I hope oh. uh, I hope we see the same kind of response um, that we saw oh. to uh, the illustrious Dr. Aaron's case. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is uh, the case of an individual in his 60s with, um, he has a poorly defined immunodeficiency. Um mm characterized by low um, immunoglobulin antibody levels, low T cells. Um, he's, he's on chronic immunoglobulin therapy because um, they had tested and, and seen that he had a poor response to vaccinations. Mm -hmm. And he gets admitted to the hospital, um, issues with hydration, electrolytes, um, and this chronic diarrhea that has been going on for a year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, he's had an upper endoscopy, right? That's where they pass the scope through the mouth, look in the upper part of the intestines, and there was inflammation of the duodenum. There was villus atrophy. There was, um, they're describing crypt hyperplasia and diffuse areas of ulcers, ulceration. Um, he then undergoes a lower colonoscopy, right? They're using a different scope for this. And they go up from below, and here they're seeing a granular appearance to the cecal mucosa. Um, there's a loss of vascularity and there's a loss of the hostral folds. People can look up hostral folds. Hostral. How do you spell that? H-A-U-S-T-R-A-L. Hostral folds. Um, they do a biopsy, actually several biopsies of the colon um, during this procedure. Um, send off some stuff for culture. Okay. 
and it gives people a little bit more. He has, as far as past medical history, he's got this immune issue that I described to some degree. He has a poorly understood interstitial lung disease. No surgeries, no allergies, um, nothing helpful from a family history review. Um, he is um, unable to work because he's debilitated over the last year by this um, chronic diarrhea. He doesn't report any toxic habits. Now, this gentleman is originally, um, he was born in Ecuador, but he moved to the U.S. when he was in his early 40s, and he's living with um, his family in one of the outer boroughs, Staten Island. That's uh, very outer borough. That's right. It's like a little, it's basically New <laughs> the Jersey. outerest borough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Um, we, we don't get any um, pets or other significant exposures. Um, as far as vitals, he comes in, he's not, um, not running a fever. His blood pressure is low. His heart rate's greater than 100. Um, his respiratory rate's a little bit high. It's in the high teens. Um, and his exam is only remarkable for the fact that he looks frail, but doesn't look toxic, doesn't look terribly ill. Um, and I'm going to give you some labs, and then we're going to let people think about this. He has a normal um, white blood cell count it's in the normal range, but it shifted to the left, as we like to say, with um, an increase in neutrophils, but he also has an increase in eosinophils. Um, his albumin is low. There is a GI PCR panel that is done, and uh, gastrointestinal, so a PCR panel on his feces. This is negative, but they do a respiratory pathogen panel, which comes back positive for rhinovirus. Um, his so he's been to Africa. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's got the rhinovirus. <laughs> Sorry. Um, they do a serum quantitative um, CMV. Uh, test and that comes back at greater than 4,000. They send out some additional tests. Uh, they're a little concerned. They start him on ivermectin and now his white blood cell count starts to go up and they start him on broad spectrum antibiotics, waiting the results of further studies. Mm. Boy, isn't it, it is complicated. <laughs> this is Very this is complicated. complicated. So he has a neutrophilia, <laughs> he has a shift to the left and an eosinophilia. What was and, the eosinophilia? Well, you didn't say how much, but I did. I just that they're elevated, and he's got an immune issue, and he's got this chronic diarrhea, and he gets and, IgG regularly. Yeah, immunoglobulins regularly. So that that would be kind of a problem for us to do any serologic. Yeah, he was going to say the CMV test might have been falsely positive because the serum that he was receiving could have had CMV antibodies in it. Or was that yeah. a, a viremia that was greater than 4,000, or was that an antibody? Yeah, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah, so what Dr. Aaron brings up is this was a measurement of the virus itself. So oh, okay. All right. So, All right. um, and uh, maybe I'll give everyone, I'm going to be nice, give everyone a hint. The colonic biopsy is what helps us in our <laughs> management. Colonic biopsy. Okay. Yes. Fascinating. So, All right, Fascinating. very good. But he also has, you know, I'll say some other things. You know, he's got his blood culture so they've done the blood to see if there's any um, bacteria in the blood he's got the biopsy stuff so yeah i'm gonna leave people with that other people in his family <laughs> uh he's the only one who's ill everyone else is doing okay right which is interesting right because with the it immune is, issue it yeah. was sort of a you know anyone in the family what, what's going on here so, said pets uh no pets no pets it's what's his occupation so, as he mentioned, he hasn't worked because worked. he's um, had this chronic health issue. What did he do before he couldn't do it? Uh, he doesn't tell us. Oh, okay. And I'm not, or I'm not going to like zookeeper that. or something. Have, like that. He, <laughs> nothing exciting. Does he, have, does he have kids? Does he? Get kids no, living? actually, he, he doesn't. You know, he he has a brother. He has um, so one brother, and he has a mother who he lives. And with he's from mother. Ecuador. Ecuador. Originally from Ecuador. And he's mar married to a woman. He, no, he's unmarried. He's unmarried. unmarried. What unmarried. What about his sex life? You know anything about that? Um, he just with women, but not often because of his um, yes. health issues. So okay, all right. There you mm. go. Thank you very much. That's TWIP one five five microbe TV slash TWIP. Please subscribe on your phone or mobile device. You can have uh, you just use your app where you listen to podcasts. Search for TWIP. Make sure it's parasitism, not photography, and subscribe. <laughs> Although you can subscribe to the other one as well, but we want you to subscribe to ours. And if you like what we do, please contribute. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. There are different ways you can help us out. 
And if you want to help, if you want to guess or try to guess today's case, twip at microbe.tv as well as your questions and comments. Our guest today has been Justin Aaron here at Cornell, not Cornell. Boy, that's no, terrible. We are not at Cornell. <laughs> you from our guest, Cornell. He's not. <laughs> our guest today has been Justin Aaron. He is here at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Thank you, Justin. Thank you very much for having me. And it's been please pleasure. come again. No, we'd love to have you back. And we understand you listen now and then, right? I, I listen. <laughs> I was uh, alerted to the existence of the podcast, I guess, uh, about two and a half years ago. By Daniel? By Daniel, while I was a fellow here. And um, and I've started listening ever since. Great. I didn't do the backlog, though. I will admit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, you have some catching up to do. <laughs> Daniel Griffin is also at Columbia University. <laughs> you almost Earthing. said Cornell. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, I have an, I have a, a, an abbreviation here, C-U-I-M-C. Uh, 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 Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, ParasitesWithoutBorders.com, and ParasiticDisease6.com. Thank you, Daniel. A uh, pleasure again. Good luck with your race. Thank yes. you. Yes. Hope you don't need it. I went sailing with my son, uh, I don't know, last week. Yep. And it all went well until he tried to jibe. Ugh. So can you teach him how to jibe? Yeah, we'll have to have you guys out. We'll do a jibing lesson. Really? You know, it just, we didn't go over this time, thank goodness, but it's very close. And then, you know, as we go to one side, I go to the other side, and then it goes back. So I go back and forth, then he yells at me for making the boat. <laughs> you know, I'll have my uh, I'll have my daughter teach him. My uh, 16-year-old daughter who just completed a th- three-day regatta, she came in second overall, right? And her response was, Daddy, I hate racing. <laughs> you may hate racing always, but you're very good. <laughs> Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org and the livingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. Pleasure. Welcome back. Yeah, thanks. Glad I'm Vincent, to be back. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to Ronald Jenkins for his music and ASM for their support. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip. Is, is parasitic. Para- we have to do this better than this. <laughs> totally off. Yeah, you know, thank three. God we're not a trio singing something. Well, when he's here, we can do it. We could. <laughs> <laughs>